Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. And verse 1. Isaiah 58 and verse 1. Speaking through Isaiah, the Lord said this, Cry aloud, Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, the house of Jacob their sins. You might be already thinking where you think this message might be going. You might be wrong. So if you would, please walk with me through this message. Let's go to the Lord and ask the Lord for help. Heavenly Father, we indeed need your help. We need your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd speak to us. I pray, God, that as your Spirit settles here and searches every heart, that hearts would be found to be open, receptive. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior, they'd come to know you. If there's anybody here that is reticent to open their heart to you regarding sin, I pray that they would repent. I pray, Lord, that we would have joy in recognizing the opportunity that we have in this great place. Your will be done in each life. I pray, Lord, that you would meet needs. I'm sure that there are those here that are suffering physically, and also people that are dealing with difficulties spiritually. Lord, I pray that there would be something that would be said this morning here that would give relief, that would give an answer. Lord, I pray most of all that this church that I love so much would be a place that truly gives glory and reveals your glory and meets its opportunity to be a testimony of our dear Savior. We pray this in our wonderful Savior's name. Amen. I believe with all my heart, and especially after going to Washington, that the battle for the very soul of this nation is at stake. Listen to me. Do you know that there are people that are being paid, paid, paid to call congressional offices where people are standing for right things and for Jesus Christ. People are being paid to call and cuss these people out. Scream at them. I met with some of these young people. We've got young people as young as 18 years old. I was in, Brother Paul, I was in Congressman Tom McClintock's office. 18-year-old young man, Paul, and getting to talking to this guy. And meanwhile, there's a 22-year-old young lady that's sitting over here and she's listening to what we're saying because of the snow situation. And you remember, you heard all about the uh, the flight cancellations. There were some people, there were some uh, congressional leaders from the West Coast. They just didn't make it in. They didn't make it in on Tuesday. They didn't make it in on Wednesday because the, the it was just all cattywampus. So we went back to Tom McClintock's office on Wednesday. The young man wasn't there. But this 22-year-old young lady was, and she came out and she said, thank you so much for encouraging this that young man yesterday. She said, you wouldn't believe. She said, I can't, I can't repeat some of the stuff that's being said on these phones. Now, do you understand that? How many of you would, hey, how many of you would like to see a young lady like Ashley or some of these young ladies, by the way, 
the, the three of you from UC Davis, raise your hand, would you? There you go. These three young ladies are students at UC Davis. And Tim Schmidt, when he was uh, visiting Pastor Alan Fong's church, recommended they come here. You make sure you greet them. Amen? But how would you like to see some of these young ladies? How'd, li how'd you like to see some of our young men, Jonathan or Ashley or, you know, or, or Mason or somebody, working those phones and having some bozo from somewhere call and absolutely using the most vile language, they are discouraged. The battle is on. But the thing that gets me is there are people knowing who's going to be answering the phones. There are people that are paying them. The George Soros types. I just got one thing to say. Be sure your sin will find you out. Folks, this is not political. This is a spiritual battle. Can, can we understand this? Did you hear what Brother Chuck Harding, who spoke here not too long ago, did you hear what he said? See, if we don't live the history, we don't always recognize it. But decades ago, decades ago, it came from the pew, excuse me, from the pulpit to the pew, the people in the pew, to the politicians, and there was our law. Folks, just a hundred years ago, sermons that were preached in the churches in America were on the front page of the newspapers. This is not, this is not a situation where all of a sudden we just stick aside, you know, th this thing. There were pastors that told Pastor Chapel, I'm not going to get involved in that, that's politics. We're politics. You understand? Of, by, and for the people. Hello? There are more people today that are actively seeking to destroy the nation than there have been at any other time in my life. I'm convinced of that. But I'm also convinced of this. This last Sunday, we got to go to two different churches. On Sunday night, we were at Independent Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland with Pastor Creed, who was here a year ago, if you remember, for our Wake America meeting. Sunday morning, we were able to go to Heritage Baptist in Woodbridge. We saw, by the way, for those of you old-timers, we got to see Jason Hayes and his wife and his four kids got to go out to lunch with them. But as I was, as I was sitting there, I was listening to the man that was preaching. It was the assistant pastor. But... I was looking at the pulpit. And you know something, folks? Set aside the man, any man that comes here. Just think of this place. You know, this is near and dear. This ought to be near and dear to people's hearts. I never want the wrong doctrine coming from this place. Folks, we're family, okay? Okay. I mean, I saw that, and it brings tears to my eyes. This place deserves prayer. Because whoever gets behind it is opening the Word of God and is saying, Thus saith the Lord. And I'm telling you, there's, there's more I've got to say about that, and I'll save it to the end. I'm not here to just say, All right, we need to deal with sin. I'm here to say this. I've come to this conclusion. I don't know what the rest of you think. But I've come to this conclusion. This is absolutely the most incredible time to be serving the Lord. I mean, this is, seriously, we're going back in some circles, we're going back to Acts chapter 1. I mean, there are situations that are happening today, I rejoice in what I heard about how God is moving in certain areas. And by the way, Satan is seeking to do that too. But such a time in the prayer closet and gospel outreach and being salt and light, it is such an incredible time. I want to I share, before we get back to Isaiah 58, I want to share something with you. Go to Acts chapter 3, would you? Acts chapter 3. 
You know this, you, you know this story. You've read it over and over again if you've been in the book of Acts. Remember, remember this story of Peter and John, <clears throat> excuse me, going to the temple. Look at verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the ninth hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Being end of the uh, hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried when they, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them or beneficence, a gift, something, that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Brother Gibbs summarized it like this. I don't have what you're looking for, but I've got what you need. And I thought, man, if you get a chance, I'll let you know when they post this. I mean, we were stunned. It was just such a message. But Brother Gibbs preached about four things that Peter had. And the first thing he had was this, the power of God in prayer the power of God in prayer. But there's a challenge for us, folks, and this is why we're going to get back to Isaiah 58. Psalm 66, 18 says this, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He also had the power of humility, and that's important. Humble yourselves, James wrote, in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. You want to make, you, you want, you want to make an impact? God will provide that, but you've got to humble yourself. Like a pastor said, every time when a big thing would come up, he would tell his fellow pastors, he would tell people in his church, help me to be small. i got to get small. Help me be small. And that's the truth. This is not about Mike Rogers, and it's not about the people that come in and fill the seats here in this church. It's about Jesus Christ. That's the answer. That's the answer. There's the power of love. 1 Corinthians 13, we know this, but the fact of the matter is the Scripture tells us if we don't have love, we've got nothing. We have nothing. And then there's the power of God's mission. As he speaks of in Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be, be converted that your sins may be blotted out. But here was the first thing that got me. And it's this. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. What do we have? If we are not humble, we don't have it. If we are not in the prayer closet, we don't have it. We don't have it. Clark said this about that message, about that verse, Psalm 66, 18. If I have seen iniquity in my heart, if I know, if I have known that it was there and I've encouraged it, I pretended that it was not, but if it's there, if I loved iniquity, while I professed to pray and to be sorry for my sin, the Lord Adonai, my stay and supporter, would not have heard. Folks, we are here. We are here to make sure that we are vessels that can be heard at the throne of grace. With that, let's go back to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Once again, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, the house of Jacob their sin. You know, let's just deal with ourselves here for a minute if we can, please. If you, if you take sin and you split them apart, you basically come up with two areas. Sins of commission, sins of omission. A lot of times we wind up thinking of sins of commission. 
A sin of commission is a deliberate act, no matter how small. It's an act where we know that it's sin, but we make a choice to do it. Now, by the way, if you remember, a choice to sin can look really good. You go back to the very first sin in Genesis chapter 3. Remember what happened when Satan wooed Eve to sin? What was it that the Scripture said? She looked and she saw that the fruit, number one, was good for food. Hey, who doesn't like to eat good food? Right? I mean, it's good. It's not only good, it's pleasant to the eyes. Anybody like looking at stuff that's ugly? So, so hear me out in this. She looked at the fruit, and it began to look like the right thing to do. Good for food, pleasant to the eyes. Thirdly, a tree to be desired to make one wise. You know, maybe this is a good thing. There's only one problem. Wrapped up in those areas is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. But it looked good! And that's sometimes what the sins of commission can look like. Can I ask you something? This last week, did you fall? Did you make a choice? You know something? If I regard iniquity in my heart, what does it say? The Lord will what? How many of you have people that you're praying for? we got a problem. But there's also the second group. There's not just the sins of commission, but there's the sins of omission. And as I was studying this, I got to thinking about this. You know something, Bruce? This is a little more subtle. This is, see, it, it's, it's easy, I think it's easier to just say, you know, not today. You know, I, I, I get busy enough, I don't have to. Do you realize that King David, before he sinned with Bathsheba, a sin of commission, he did a sin of omission? What was it that he did? When the time came that he was kings go forth to battle, nah, I ain't going. A sin of omission. You know, how many times have we fallen into the sin of omission when it comes to the prayer closet? When it comes to getting out the gospel? When it comes to being salt and light? When it comes to doing the right thing? Now look, we're not here and I'm not here for us to start looking at each other. Because one of the things that we don't do is we don't compare ourselves among ourselves like Paul told the church at Corinth. In fact, we just ought to maybe just come to this thought. You know what? Every one of us sinned this last week. Anybody not sin? If you raise your hand, you're lying. You just sinned. So, you know what? What we do, we gather as the body of Christ and we ask ourselves this, okay, what did we do with the sin? And in fact, what are we doing to cleanse ourselves when it comes from sin? Are we really looking for that cleansing? Like David Gibbs preached when he was here, not just getting cleaner, but clean. We're all in the flesh. We have a flesh. And like John wrote in 1 John 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive, our, deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Dealing with sin is never, ever an easy task. It's never an easy task. I don't know what you thought about when you read this this last week in your, in your Bible reading, but this, this is the reason why. I, I mean, I, I read all this. It was fascinating reading again where we were at. But the fact of the matter is, I kept going back to this verse where God has called us. It's not just me. It's all of us to encourage, to provoke unto love and to good works, and to say, listen, we can't do this. 
There are things that we need to stay away from, and there are things that we need to cling to. We cannot disobey. So what happens? It's never an easy task to deal with sin. When it, when it, when it comes to somebody else, you, you wind up having like a, a person like Isaiah who is commanded in this verse to confront those guilty of transgression. What happens? Have you ever had, have you ever confronted somebody about their sin? All of a sudden you're called judgmental, nosy, a meddler, or worse. You're challenged about your own actions, truthful or otherwise. How many of you recognize there's interesting, it's an interesting situation when people watch you. They know what you do or don't do. We get to know each other. You can be accused of being cruel and heartless as some do confront sin in such a manner. You ever hear of Westboro Baptist? Foolish. You're told it's none of your business. When in fact, for the believer in encouraging each other, it is our business. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of what? Meekness considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is how we encourage each other. But you know what? On the other side is the accused. Think about the person that is dealing with the sin in their life, and you wind up going to the person. i tell you what, it's happened to me before. Before somebody comes and deals with me on something, God's already been dealing with me on it. That's hard. Often you've already recognized the sin in your life, and many times you feel awful about it. You may have been struggling with that sin for some time, and you truly desire victory. Those of you that are in the RU class, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When people come in, and they want something done, and then you begin to deal with them, they're feeling bad about this. It may be that the person confronting you specializes in pointing out other people's failures while they turn a blind eye to their own. Remember, you know, whatever what's in your eye, somebody comes in, they want to take out the speck of dust in your eye while they've got a lumber yard in their own. It winds up getting hard. You know, this is where we do the big time out, especially as a church. Why do we deal with sin? Number one, the wages of sin is what? i tell you what, it's like cancer. You know, we don't want that around. And talking to uh, uh, Ron Hamilton, I didn't know this, but he told me a few years ago, he wound up having cancer again. He had prostate cancer. They had to take his prostate. You know, it gets tough. There are people that are dealing with, you know, with, with these things. Hey, death is nothing to laugh about, is it? Death is nothing, nothing to make a joke about. And when there is something that gets into the body, hey, we ought to love each other enough. And also people out there, they're dying because of their sin, even though they don't know it. This is why. The Scripture tells us, cry aloud, spare not, show my people their transgression. This is what we're supposed to do. This last week, when we were reading, and we're going to go through this quickly. This last week when we were reading, we saw people in different stages of being dealt with concerning their sin. If you'll trust me on this, you've already read it this last week. But if you'll trust me on this, just go with me quickly. You don't have to turn there. But just ask Paul as he dealt with the church at Corinth. You read 1 John 5 1. It is reported common, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 5 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He took his stepmom and he was living with her. Then the very next chapter, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Dare any of you Having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Paul was busy with the church at Corinth 
dealing with sin. It's never easy. Just ask Joseph's brethren. How many of you love the story of Joseph? Isn't it awesome to read this? So here was Joseph. He's taken away. You know, his brothers got rid of him, and he goes through all this. I'm telling you, I can't wait to talk to Joseph when I get to heaven. But then he becomes number two in the land, and guess who comes asking for food? His brothers. Genesis 42, 7. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. <laughs> and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. You skip down later on in Genesis 42, and you read this, verse 21. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother. This is why we deal with sin, folks, because sin has a way of coming home to roost. And that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spare I not, excuse me, spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter, and he turned himself about from them and wept. Hey, they wound up dealing with their sin. Sin is never easy to deal with. That's why you have people sometimes going, don't get near me. I can handle myself. Just ask Eli. We read this this last week in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before the Eli the priest. Who was this? This was the one that Hannah prayed for. She had a son. Praise God, his name was Samuel. And she gave him to the Lord. She lent him to the Lord, and he spent the rest of his life there at the temple. Who with? A man by the name of Eli, who was the high priest. There was only a problem, though. Eli had two sons that were wicked. wicked. They were hell-bound. They were in the flesh big time. They were into, uh, they were into committing gross sin. They were into feeding their flesh and Eli wouldn't stop them. And what took place? In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11, and the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. What's going to take place? Both the sons will die. Eli will die. The, the uh, ark of God will be carried off. And that's exactly what took place. Even if you listen to Job in chapter 21, verse 17, he said, How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. Folks, there's a time that's coming called the Great Tribulation. I believe we are walking among people right now that are going to live through it. And during that time, the anger of God was going to come down. There's been tri tribulation on the earth. This is known as the Great Tribulation. Folks, our hearts ought to break. When they don't want to hear the gospel, when they turn it aside, this is no laughing matter. When your soul is at stake, you'd better make sure. You had better make sure sure that you're right if you are rejecting a holy God. No laughing matter at all. Why? Be sure your sin will find you out. Amen? For the Christian, it's the same thing. Hey, listen, we want to be used by God. Go to Isaiah. Go to the next chapter, chapter 59. Look at verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Listen, four weeks from today, four weeks from today, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are able to come and we are able to preach from God's Word and rejoice in a coming Savior 
all because of what Jesus Christ did. If we are going to do it properly, it must be by this. We listen to Isaiah 58.1, and we say, Lord, listen, if there's sin in my life, I want it down. I want it gone. I want it done. I want it gone out of my life. Six weeks from today, we begin with evangelist Mike Pelletier. Look, the reason why I entitled this message, God's Show and Tell, is because as you read the Scripture, you see God in action, showing and telling, this is sin, don't do it, this is sin, repent, do right, do what I've called you to do. Have you ever read, have you ever read the commandments of Christ? We wind up dealing with the sins of omission and the sins of commission in this. If you are not, listen, if you can idly go by and commit sin and say, you know what, it's no big deal to me, check your salvation. Check your salvation. Why? Hebrews 12, 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. You're a child of God. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're illegitimate children. You think you belong to the family. You don't. If you can sin and think nothing of it or very little of it, if you think, you know something, I can take my chance, let me tell you something, you need to come get saved. Amen? I, look, you, you know what saddens me? Folks, I know this for a fact. I know this. And some of you would too, I'm sure. There are faces that have been in this auditorium that have seen this man preach, give the gospel. And they've said no. You know that. Maybe you've invited some of them. Do you know what awaits them? Folks, this is no laughing matter. We've got to take this seriously. I don't want, listen... I don't want to be separated from God when it comes to the power that I need. Would you? Do you realize and recognize what we need to have? I, I can't, you know, there, there's times when I just, I, I fall flat on this. Because it, it's, it's not of me, it's of God. But folks, I really, I really mean it when I say I, I cannot, I can't begin to express what I believe is the opportunity that God has given us to serve Him. This is an absolutely incredible time to walk the streets of Washington, D.C. and recognize that there is such hatred coming from some groups. But there are people that are shining the gospel light. And also in our own capital, same thing. In our neighborhoods, same thing. Meanwhile, on television, the most vile stuff is coming out. The most wicked. And the things in the media, the things in the news. I mean, Edgar and I were out when, when we were out uh, on the street yesterday. For visitation. Who's coming right up behind us? Russellites. Here. Here's something else that you can read that can help you go to hell. That's no joke. That's no joke. I mean, if Jesus Christ bled and died and rose again for what we're talking about, how in the world can we whistle in the dark? But you know, sadly, sometimes we do. I know, because I'm made out of the same stuff you are. There are times I have been challenged by a message, and within days, what challenge? What challenge? There's so much that the Lord has told us. This, is, this was not in our reading, but Paul made this statement. 1 Corinthians 11.31 for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. I want, I want you to imagine this. I'm going to put myself in this chair.
And let's just say this is God's throne, and this is where he's sitting, and I'm over there. You know what I need to do and what we all need to do? We need to sit ourselves down before God, and then we need to walk over here on God's side. We know our lives, don't we? We know them. We take God's law, we take the Word of God, and standing with God, we look at ourselves and say, you know what, i got to get this right. I've got to get that right. I mean, Tim Schmidt and I had a great time in talking and, 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 and dealing with people back over in Washington and hearing the preaching about people that are spending hours in prayer. I'd like for you to do this. Look, I, I'm, you, you know me, I'm flesh and blood, and y'all have put up with me. Good night, coming up on 26 years. But it's not about us. It's about Him. Amen? Now, let, let's, let's, play a, let's play a game called Drop Dead Honest. How many of you have places in your lives, spiritually, where there is some overcoming that you'd like to have? Would you please raise your hand? My hand is up. Okay, thank you. You may put your hands down. I hesitate to tell this story, but I, I, I'm going to go ahead and I, and I want you to take it right. I'm not, this is not a thing of bragging. Did you see where I was with David Gibbs in the picture? You know, he wasn't able to make it a few weeks ago. And so I said, hey, you know, we'd really love to have you on a Sunday. I said, look, Brother Gibbs, I, I, this was a stupid thing to say. I said, you know, I, I know we're only a church of about 80 people. And he stopped and he looked at me. And he said this. He said, your church casts a greater shadow than you think. He said, I know churches of thousands that don't cast a shadow like yours does. You know why? Because we've stepped out. Two-minute warning. Awake America. Are you? I mean, on and on and on. Now, I, you know, I, maybe he was being, I, I, I think, you know, maybe he's, he's being kind. But the point is this. We, we've, we've got an opportunity because of where we are and what God has done in us. We've got an opportunity that I think is tremendous. Folks, we need to get in the prayer closet. We need to get in the prayer closet. Next Sunday, after the morning service, we're having the Lord's table, and we're going into prayer. I don't know how long it's going to be. I think, you know, maybe we'll just, you know, go for an hour. But folks, we've got to pray. There are, there are people, who, listen, there's those of us, we need to see some victory. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I'm praying for in my life, but I just know this. I, I feel like sometimes I feel like that old black preacher that was preaching, and he's talking about the power of God. And somebody in the back says, hey, what am the power? And the guy got tears in his eyes, and he says, I don't know what it is, but I sure know what it ain't. You hear me? I just, I, I want to see God work in us. We've got young people that need encouragement. We've got people that need victory over sin. We have to see in three dimensions the need for people that are lost. There are people that are going through life and they call themselves Christians. 
We're gonna we're gonna cross we're gonna cross into glory one day, and we're gonna see we had we were up I mean we were up close and personal with people. They're gonna be in hell for the rest of eternity. How many of you believe in hell? And I mean the need is closer than we think. Can I challenge you to do this? Here came a call through Isaiah. Cry aloud, spare not, show my people their transgression. That can only be done by the power of the Spirit. We need to be right with God. I mean, we need to let God deal. I mean, just just drill deep. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because I don't want you to feel guilty and you raise your hand and then later on. But would you please under, would you please think of this? Ten minutes in the prayer closet isn't going to make it. We need to learn what it means to pray without ceasing. We need to learn what it means praying, being with God while we're walking, while we're sitting, we're standing. Shut off the television. Shut down the computer sometimes and go to the throne of grace. We need to pray. Would you join your preacher in this? I mean, listen, I'm praying, Lord, make me small. I'm recognizing I got nothing. There's one thing that I can have by God's grace, and that's His His power, His grace. I saw a nation, the greatest nation on earth, and people are struggling at the very top. They want to see God be glorified. I want to see it here at the Capitol, too. We can do more than we think. Not casting a shadow for our glory, but for His. I'll tell you right now, I'm sensing very much. I mean, there's sins of omission and commission in my life. I just, I want to be clean. I know I'm taking time to, to just drive this home, but this has to be driven. By the way, if you're in here and you're not saved, I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, be sure your sin will find you out. There is a hell that is coming. And you can sit here and deny all you want, but you denying it isn't going to close the door, put the fire out. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and for mine. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. Amen. This is real. This is real. I appreciate you so much listening. It's been kind of a different message. But oh, how we need it. You girls, going to, going to UC Davis, how is it being a Christian over there? Get kind of tough sometimes? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would just deal right now with our hearts. Lord, I pray that that, that you'd work. I, I, I pray that the desire, the need for prayer would just settle on each and every heart. We need to be in the prayer closet, Lord. We need to have that list with us. We need to be praying for people. We need to be praying for power. I pray that, God, you would just open your heart. It might not be happening now, but Lord, as people go home or wherever they are, they would know that your Spirit is still dealing with them. With heads bowed and eyes closed,